Thank you, God. Bridgewater, do we have much to be thankful for this morning? Yes. yes. There's so much around us to be thankful for. Well, I am thankful to be here with you all. My name is Liz, and if we have not had a chance to meet yet, or if you're kind of looking around going, I'm pretty sure that's not the guy who's normally standing up there. You are correct. I am the pastor of children and young adults here at Bridgewater. And oh, wow, cool, thanks. Yeah, it's fun. Um, <laughs> and this morning, I get to be with you in big church. Big church is always a nice place to escape to, although I'm going to be missing my littles this morning, which reminds me that the only way that I can be here in this space is because we have an incredible team of volunteers and teachers and leaders who serve in our kids' spaces on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and Sunday evenings. And we just want to give a big thank you to them. If you are here in our second service and you serve on our kids' team, thank you so much. If you guys would give them a round of applause. We appreciate you all. And give an extra moment of gratitude and of thanks to any children's workers that you see after service today. I'm just so grateful to them um, for making my transition so easy and for being a part of what we do and giving our kids a safe, Jesus-loving, fun space to be in on Sunday mornings. Anyone feeling a theme this morning? Like many families and communities all across our nation this week, we are going to spend some time together looking at the practice of and centrality of gratitude and our perspectives on life and relationships and ultimately in our faith. As I begin to dig into this topic a little bit, I googled it first and was like, gratitude, what's going on with gratitude right now? And I noticed that it's kind of become something of a buzzword in the psychology and self-help realms. So I started looking at articles and journaling prompts and these psychology reports that talk about the science of our brains. And I got a little bogged down by it all. And there are some really cool things that you can find when you look into that. And the Lord did design our brains to be that way. But he kind of pulled me out from under the pile of things and brought me from the secular and drew me back to the sacred that we find in his word. So this morning, we're going to go straight to the source, and we're going to look at Psalm 136 and dig in a little bit to what it looks like when we realize who God is, remember what he has done, and respond in relationship. Did you catch my three R's? Pastor Drew is so good at making sure that these all fit together and that they go with the right letters. So since I think he'll listen to this later, I thought I'd just like, you know, get him to be proud of me with that one. So we're going to realize, remember, and respond today. The first thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to read Psalms 136, verses 1 through 3 together. And what I want that to look like is I'm going to read the first line, and then you all are going to read the line that's in italics, the second line. Then I'm going to read the third line, and you're going to read the fourth line. Then I'm going to read the fifth line, and you're going to read the sixth line. All right, let's try it together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Okay. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. All right. By the end of that, it was a little bit better. Let's say that last line all together one more time, thinking about the things that you were sharing with people when Pastor Tyler asked us to share something we were grateful for. So out of that place, let's say the last line, all of us together. Here we go. His love endures forever. That is an incredible statement. Maybe you've heard or studied this passage before, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time. This is not the first time that I'd heard this passage, but it is the first time that I pause to really take a look at what the psalmist is emphasizing and what he's doing with this. So I want to give us something to think about. In the first three verses of this, rather than immediately stating all of the things that God has done, 
or telling us about all of the gifts that God has given, the psalmist gives us three statements about who God is. It says he is good. It says he is the God of gods, and it says that he is the Lord of lords. Gods and lords, with S's, plural. Doesn't the psalmist realize that there is only one God? If we take a look at the cultural clues surrounding when this psalm would have been written, which was about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus, we find that it was a very tribal society, and they had a lot of tribal gods. The word for that, this is your seminary word for the day, so like, take notes, we'll do a quiz later. Polytheism. Polytheistic means instead of worshiping one god, you worship many gods. So this was a very polytheistic society. There were gods for specific regions, and they only had power in those specific regions. There were gods for the weather, gods of fertility, guard, go, guards? gods of the harvest. Basically, if it impacted your daily life, there was a god that was attributed to that. And this may seem like an ancient concept to us, but I've seen it up close. A few years ago, I had the incredible opportunity to travel with an organization called Adventures and Missions on a trip called the World Race. This is different than the Amazing Race. So World Race, Amazing Race. Amazing Race is the televised one. And I will admit that there was probably moments of similar levels of drama and exhaustion on the trip that I was on, but they're different things. And the brief summary of what the World Race looks like is that for 11 months, you travel with 50 other young adults to 11 countries, one each month, participating and serving alongside of ministries and nonprofits in each location. And several of the countries that I got to visit during that year are heavily polytheistic. So Hinduism and certain sects of B Buddhism are examples of this. The picture that you see on the screen is a temple, a shrine that we visited in Nepal. And our ministry on the day that we visited this temple was basically to make observations and to just pray in our spirit as we listen to what God was doing and observe people there. And immediately when we walked through the gates of this place, you just got this kind of weird sense of confusion. And, like, people were kind of just wandering and kind of lost, and there wasn't a real direction even to, like, walk in when you got there. And all around the outside parameters of this temple space, there were vendors. And all of these little vendors were selling different things, so offerings and incense and little tiny figurines and different things that the people would bring to these shrines. They'd pay money for them, and then they'd offer them to these gods. I am not anywhere near being a scholar on world religions, but I do know that the God that we serve does not operate like this. Our God, the one true God, who in the Hebrew Bible they call him Yahweh, and they don't even speak that word or write it with all of the letters because it's so holy. The one true God, Yahweh, is not one of these little tribal gods that the psalmist mentions, and that I experienced people trying to bring honor and glory to around the world. Yahweh is good, and his love endures forever. This is what sets him apart. This is what, in fact, in this chapter, the psalmist reiterates 26 different times in the passage. So at the end of every single verse, you find his love endures forever. In the Hebrew, there's actually a special symbol that they added to the beginning of those lines that says, make sure that you acknowledge that his love endures forever every time you read any of these statements. The word that they use for love in Hebrew in this setting was hesed, which, excuse the way this is about to sound, I think is like chesed, but we're going to avoid using it like that because of the noise you just heard. And Hesed actually speaks even more fully of the Lord's kindness, the Lord's goodness, his mercy, and the eternal nature of each of those aspects. When we begin to realize the true nature of God, we turn away from these little gods that we've been worshiping. And I think I've let lots of little gods take the attention and focus and desire 
that should be reserved for God alone. Any of you have little gods that have taken that same space? Maybe it's your time or your money. Maybe it's, maybe it's a dream that the Lord has given you, but that you've decided to control yourself. Maybe it's even the gift of your spouse or the gift of your children. Now, we know that those things are not inherently sinful, bad things, right? They're gifts from God. But if we allow them to become idols, we are prohibiting the blessings that the true God wants to pour out on us. Pastor Drew often articulates this in terms of rivers and reservoirs. And he says that we can choose to be a river, which means we allow the Spirit to flow through us, and that we allow rivers of gratitude and blessing to flow out into the people around us, or we can become a reservoir, just storing up those blessings that the Lord has given and becoming stagnant and unable to allow the Lord to pour any more into us. Living a life of gratitude looks more like the river. It pours out when we realize who God is. He is good, he is the God of gods, and he is the Lord of lords. Psalm 136 continues by remembering specific examples of times when the Lord had been faithful to his people. We won't read each of them, but I want you to get a picture of what we're talking about here. In verses 4 through 9, we read reminders that this is the God who created all the wonders of the universe. The stars, the planets, the waters, the life that we live, it all comes from him. And in verses 10 through 15, it gets specific with the story of the Israelites, who are God's chosen people, and the incredible ways that he frees them and restores them and stays faithful to them, even in their wandering. And then we get to verse 16. And in verse 16, the psalmist recalls God guiding his people through the wilderness. Have you ever been in a season that you would define as a wilderness? I know I have. In fact, if I'm going to be completely honest, and I know this is my first time standing in front of you, so are we good with a little vulnerability? Safe space? Okay, cool. If we're going to be honest, I think I'm just now kind of stepping out of a season that I would call wilderness. How many of you are outdoorsy, like camping, hiking through the mud, getting lost in the woods? Okay, lots of little hands up here. I, I love being in nature, and I think God definitely speaks through creation and through spaces like that. But this is a little bit different of a wilderness. This is not a chosen wilderness, but it's one that we find ourselves in that's kind of full of unknowns. That's not to say that there can't be beauty or adventure in those seasons, but it can be a difficult place to dwell for a bit. Only four months ago, if you would have mentioned Bridgewater Church to me, I would have been able to tell you about three things. One, it's in my hometown. Two, they're known for serving their community well. I'd heard of events like Family Fun Day and Light the Night. And three, it's real close to a Target and a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so lots of good things, right? Well, I was living in Phoenix at the time, and serving in a church where God was and is doing amazing things, and he's calling that place and people and ministry to a brand new season, one that is filled with adventure and with beauty and lots of unknowns for them too. But at the beginning of the summer, I began to feel this shifting of some things in my mind and in my heart that the Lord was doing. Now, wouldn't it be great if that kind of tension or those kind of shifts also came with some, like, immediate answers, like God's like, we're going to do some moving, and here's what it's going to look like. But that's totally not how it typically works in my life. And so as soon as I started feeling this and praying into it, it felt more like the Holy Spirit was asking me to identify some of those little gods in my life and to release them to him and to lay them down at his feet. Some of those things for me were security, the community that I built around myself, my own routine, my future plans. And so he's asking me to release those things. But pretty immediately, I started worrying about what that meant. Did I need to look for jobs? Was I going to have a job? Was I going to leave my sweet community? 
for a brand new place and a brand new people? Was my present time there of any value? How would I know where to go? All of the things. And in the worry and anxiety, you know what happened? I started to lose sight of who God is. His goodness, his faithfulness, his promise to guide his people, which you and I are, by the way, through the wilderness and into the land that he has promised to us. Now, this isn't the first time in my life that I'd struggled with anxiety. And I'm sure in the months and years to come, there will be lots of space for me to tell you a little bit more about that story. But right now, while we have a second, if you ever need somebody that you want to share that experience with, I've walked that road. And it's not an easy one to walk alone. And so in these moments, a couple of months ago, when I started feeling some of that, I knew that it wasn't healthy for me to walk it by myself. And so walking it with other believers and people who are experienced with those kind of things is a great way to handle it. So I started meeting with a Christian counselor, and as I shared with her how I'd been feeling, she simply sat and listened. And isn't that sweet? <gasps> no, that was frustrating to me. Why? Because I wanted her to look at me and say, this is what your life is going to look like. Here's what you should do. This is what this means for the calling that God has on your life. But instead, when I finished venting all the things to her, she looked at me and she asked me about my contemplative practices. And I was like, my what? <laughs> and she began to explain to me the importance of, wait for it, spending time thinking about who God is and remembering what he has done. It's gratitude, she said. Gratitude is the antidote for anxiety. Gratitude is the antidote for anxiety. Gratitude is how we remain present while being filled with the anticipation of the promised land. It's a discipline that must be practiced in our everyday moments. Then she pulled out a well-read copy of a book that I had read several years ago. And from a page that she'd marked with this worn little pink threadbare bookmark, she read the following quote. Gratitude, however, goes beyond the mine and thine, and it claims the truth that all of life is a pure gift. In the past, I always thought of gratitude as a spontaneous response to the awareness of gifts received, but now I realize that gratitude can also be lived as a discipline. The discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all I am and have is given to me as a gift of love to be celebrated with joy. And that's a quote in a book by Henry Nouwen, who, if you haven't had a chance to read his books, he writes a lot about stillness and about spending time with the Lord and living a life out of a place of gratitude. Living a life of gratitude requires that we get intentional about remembering who God is and what he has done for us, all based on his enduring love, mercy, goodness, faithfulness, Chesed. It's not circumstantial. It's not based solely on our emotions, which is a really good thing, right? And when we live this way, gratitude it takes the space that was previously filled with anxiety, with depression, with bitterness, and we're able to walk through the wilderness that we will inevitably walk through, right? With a little more wonder, noticing the beauty and enjoying the adventure. I found this to be very true for me, even in the little moments. Learning to live out of gratitude allowed me to be present in a place, even when I sensed that the Lord might be calling me soon to something new. I'm so thankful for my last couple of months in Phoenix. They were some of the most fruitful times that I experienced in my several years there. But if I'd stayed in a place of worry and of distraction, I think there's a really good chance that I would have missed some of those moments. Would God have still been moving and present? Yes, absolutely. But is there a really good chance that I could have missed out on his best for me? Yeah, probably. And ultimately, remembering that the Lord faithfully guides his people to the places that he promised led me to the season of being here at Bridgewater with you close to my family, in a place where I'm constantly learning more about what it looks like to live a life of gratitude 
in the midst of growth and in the midst of transition. So before we move on to our final R word, let's recap for a second. We realize who God is. He's good. He's God of gods. He's Lord of lords. We remember what he has done through intentional practice and discipline. And finally, we're going to, third R, respond. So repeat these after me. Realize. Realize. Remember. Remember. Respond. Respond. Great job. So what is our response to all of this? When we have a true understanding of who God is, And when we are intentionally spending time recognizing this gift of love and of life that he's given us, we respond in our relationships with God and in our relationships with others. We're going to look at what it looks like to respond in our relationship with God first. And I want us to look at a practical tool that we can use to intentionally respond to God with gratitude in our daily lives. There's an ancient church practice, and it's called the examine. And the examine is a tool that has helped me to reflect on the ways that God has been at work in my day. And it's, it's specific to a 24-hour period, if you practice this regularly. But you could use it for the last week, the last month. Maybe you even want to look at the last year of your life as we come into the holiday season. And we're going to actually practice this together. And so what it's going to look like is there are like five thoughts and questions that I'm going to guide us through. But this is a time just for you to reflect with the Lord on the things that he's doing in your life and that he wants to point out to you so that you can live more fully out of the gratitude of what he's doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to dim the lights in the room And you are free to close your eyes when we get to this point. You don't have to if you don't want to. I do. It helps me to focus. Because, let's be real, another honesty moment. Focus is not always my strong suit. And especially at the end of a day or in the midst of a chaotic holiday season, getting focused on the Lord and intentionally living out gratitude is not easy. So, we're going to turn the lights down. I'm going to close our eyes. You don't have to do anything except for listen to my words. And I will talk through these five questions. In between each one, I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to just meditate on it and to think through it. Now, that is not enough time in reality to really get to dwell in some of the really cool things that God wants to reveal to us. But we're going to practice it today in this way so that you have a tool to take with you that you can intentionally lean into in your lives at home and at work and with your families. Sound good? Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and dim the lights. You can go ahead and close your eyes. Just take a deep breath. Kind of relax in the space that you're in. You can just listen as we read through this together. All right. The first thing that I want us to think about is to just become aware of God's presence in your life. Look back on the events of your day or of your week that were all lived in the company of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't absent for a single moment of it. Maybe the day or the week seems confusing, a blur, a jumble, a muddle. Ask God to bring clarity and understanding to those moments. Question number two. Review your day with gratitude. Gratitude is the foundation of our relationship with God. Walk through those memories in the presence of God and note the moments of joy or delight. Focus on the day's gifts. Maybe look at the work that you did, the people you interacted with. What did you receive from them? What did you give to them? Pay attention to small things. Maybe the food you ate, the sights you saw, and other seemingly small pleasures. God is in the details. Third thought, pay attention to your emotions. We can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit through our emotions. Reflect on feelings that you experienced in the last 24 hours. 
maybe boredom, hopefully not yet this morning, elation, resentment, maybe even anger. What does God want to say to you through those feelings? Fourth step, choose one feature of the day and pray out of that space. So ask God to direct you to maybe something that he thinks is particularly important for you. It may involve a feeling, maybe positive or negative. It may be a significant moment with another person, maybe a family member, or a vivid moment of joy or of peace. It might be something that seems kind of insignificant, but lean into it. Pray about it. And allow yourself to pray from that space. Maybe it's praise. Maybe it's repentance. Maybe it's intentional gratitude. And lastly, we want to look forward to tomorrow. Ask God to give you hope for tomorrow's challenges. Pay attention to the feelings that surface as you think about what's coming up. Are you doubtful, apprehensive, filled with anticipation? Allow those things to turn into prayer. Seek God's guidance, pray for hope, and do all of this in the spirit of gratitude, responding to God in thanks for his enduring love. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and open your eyes. Does anybody feel a little bit different already? Just taking an intentional moment to pause and to breathe and to think through the things that God's doing helps me feel a little more steady and bring a sense of just that deepening of the peace that he wants to pour out on us. I want to encourage you to find times like this in your day, in your week, to really lean into God and to give yourself some specific moments of focus. I was talking to somebody before the service, after our first service, who mentioned that it felt difficult in this space to even come up with something because so much has been going on, right? That's okay. Just practicing the pause is a good thing. And as you continue to do that, the Lord's going to move in unique ways when we give him intentional space to do that. All right. Living a lifestyle of gratitude impacts not only you and your sense of peace and your relationship with God, but it also impacts the way that we respond to those around us. In our relationships with others, we respond through sharing and through service. I saw this in action just last night at my parents' house. My younger brother took a pretty nasty fall on Wednesday night, and he spent some hospital time and is laid up in a neck brace. And he's the handyman of the house, and so there were some projects around the house that needed to be taken care of as we move into the holiday season. And as soon as some sweet family friends heard that there was anything they could do to help, they showed up with food, they showed up with chainsaws to help cut up the tree that fell in the ice storm last week. They showed up with nail guns to help take care of the baseboards and the family room project that was being completed. And you could look at all of that and go, wow, aren't those kind people to come and help in a time of need? And that's true. They are kind people who did help in a time of need. But if you look at their lifestyles, I think you'd see that this isn't a rare occasion. Serving the ones around them flows out naturally out of the rivers of gratitude, rivers, not reservoirs, rivers of gratitude in their lives. Maybe responding with gratitude in a relationship for you means offering forgiveness to someone who doesn't deserve it. Maybe it looks like paying forward an act of kindness that's been shown to you recently. Maybe it's spending a few extra moments 
as you're tucking your child in tonight, remembering to thank God for the gift of that little life. Maybe it's volunteering to serve in children's ministry. And if it is, find me afterwards. We can make that happen. Or maybe, maybe honestly, maybe this is all just a bit much for you this morning. Maybe you are in your own wilderness season, wondering what God is up to or questioning whether he's up to anything at all. You're not alone. In fact, even when you look at the Psalms, where our passage this morning came out of, you find poems and songs of grief and of questioning. Even in our wandering, even in our wilderness, God never walks away. His love endures forever. And this love perfectly embodied in the person of Jesus Christ who desires relationship with you so deeply that he died in order to restore that relationship even if it was just you. Mike and Mary are going to come and they're going to lead us in a time of worship and response and I want to challenge you in two ways. The first is this. If you find yourself In a place of needing restoration in your relationship with a good God through his love that endures forever. This morning is a great time to begin that journey. We'd love to meet you at the altars. These are a safe place to pray or to answer any questions that you have following the service. Secondly, if you have much to be grateful for, and you're ready to step into an even more intentional lifestyle of gratitude, we invite you to worship with us through song and through prayer and through praise. The altars are open to you as well. Join me together as we thank God for his mercy and goodness and prayer in this place this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness, for your love that endures forever. God, bring us to a deeper realization of who you are. We remember the ways that you've been so faithful to us, and we want to respond as your Holy Spirit leads. God, give us your eyes and heart as we seek to share your story and to serve the ones around us. We are so grateful for your presence with us this morning and always. We love you. Amen.